thank you for coming to what I think promises to be um, a very stimulating session and obviously a very uh, apposite session, um, as you heard from this morning. Before I make a few introductory remarks, can I just remind you who we've got here to address the uh, title containing the North Korean threat. Um, and I'm going to work from left to right. Um, Aidan Foster Carter uh, uh, from Britain, uh, a long-term and well-established expert on North Korea. Um, Mr. Sugiyama, well, that hasn't gone very well, has it? Anyway, right. Um, <laughs> Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs from Japan. Um, Colonel Liu from China's Institute for Strategic Studies. And Mr. Yoon, the Director General of the Republic of Korea's International Policy Bureau in the Ministry of National Defense, but a Foreign Service Officer uh, by training and experience. Um, just a few introductory remarks to help frame the, uh, our discussion, uh, essentially on uh, definitions. Um, 2016 is self-evidently a key year uh, in the context of North Korea. Um, you could say it's a key year for other reason, reasons too, not least because a new American president uh, will be elected and his or her approach to this issue is going to be very important. Good luck to us all. Um, in Britain, we might be leaving the European Union. I don't think that's going to have a huge impact on this issue, but you never know. Certain people think it will. Um, but for more important reasons in the context of this subject, uh, can the region and the USA in particular live uh, with a nuclear-capable uh, North Korea? Uh, if so, it must certainly further develop its existing containment strategy, if you could grace uh, its current approach with the term strategy uh, as a minimum. Uh, this process will inform the other option, which is arguably exploiting this window uh, for preemptive military action of some kind. What do we mean by containment? Uh, I actually bothered on your behalf to look up what containment meant. When I was Chief of Defence Staff, uh, I uh, was recommending a containment strategy for ISIS in the Middle East. And uh, I'll never forget uh, someone in our own foreign office uh, asking what the hell I meant by containment strategy. Uh, I thought that was pretty baffling because it's pretty self-evident, but it clearly is not necessarily the case. So Wikipedia defines containment as a military strategy to stop the expansion of an enemy. It represents a middle ground between rollback and detente. It was famously George Kennan's doctrinal brainchild in the, in about 1946, 47, uh, motivated by the need to contain communist expansion, and it led to NATO and in due course other non-military initiatives such as the Marshall Plan. Kennan, interestingly, subsequently moved on in his analysis, and I'm just going to read out something. He said, containment not by military means of a military threat, but the political containment of a political threat. And whatever else, containment does not appear, and this is important to include, for example, a preemptive military strike, nor indeed a strategy based on a more accommodating strategy of detente. We may, however, in this uh, forum today, if you wish, include both those ideas uh, in our discussion. So I've already broadened for our benefit the theoretical interpretation of what containment means. Uh, one other point I think of importance, North Korea um, has relearned the lessons of Libya 2011. Would those like Great Britain who took part in the attack on Libya have done so if Colonel Gaddafi had nuclear weapons and a means of delivering them? I think I wouldn't be alone in telling you um, that in my judgment we would not have done. Uh, and I think that's an important underlying theme. So this issue, what to do about North Korea, is especially important this year, 2016. 
Uh, North Korea uh, will possess a nuclear capability that's genuine, credible, within a year or two. Um, do we prevent it through military action or contain it through a multi-dimensional strategy of military and political initiatives? So that's, that's really what we're focusing on. In what I said a minute ago, I, I think will be a fascinating uh, 90 minutes or so. So I am going to start this time, I'm going to get this right, from right to left, uh, and ask uh, Mr. Fukuyama, please, to kick off our session. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for your kind introduction, David. Um, the, um, uh, and thank you for all uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, together and uh, all of you uh, participants and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I very much would like to uh, tell you that I feel very much certain happy to be back to uh, this uh, rather well-established uh, Shangri-La Dialogue uh, 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 which I uh, accompanied my uh, Prime Minister when my Prime Minister did give the, uh, the keynote speech two years ago or something. And at that time, I uh, uh, took a part, uh, like I am doing, uh, uh, some separate session. Uh, that was a time when uh, we are talking about uh, our biggest neighbor. Uh, but uh, this time, uh, uh, the theme uh, which is being given by the chair or the uh, uh, IISS or, or Shanghai Dialogue uh, 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 organizers uh, is, uh, in a sense, uh, slightly uh, much easier uh, 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 theme, uh, DPLK, uh, to talk about. Um, uh, simply because that, uh, uh, well, many things have been said. Uh, we haven't uh, reached any kind of, you know, um, uh, panacea type you know, solutions. And yet, everybody seems to be agreeing uh, that what the DPRK is doing is totally wrong. Um, the, um, actually, uh, I'm sorry to uh, my interpreter uh, that I have given a sheet of paper which has been prepared by my government, but I'm not reading through, um, uh, which is, I wouldn't say waste of time, but uh, I was war warned by David that, uh, you know, panelists tend to speak longer. Uh, so I try to cut short uh, instead of reading my uh, 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 prepared text. Uh, I would like to speak up uh, uh, of uh, what I really uh, want uh, to say. Um, as I said, um, the, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, this subject matter over more than two decades, um, at least from 1990, immediately after 1992, when uh, North and uh, South uh, you know, uh, made a um, uh, historic uh, joint statement, and they together uh, were accepted as a member uh, of the United Nations. And immediately after that, uh, this uh, nuclear thing uh, uh, started uh, to argue. Uh, there are kind of you know, ups and downs over the past uh, more than two decades, um, uh, such as uh, agreed framework uh, in, uh, in the midst of 1994 or five or something, or 200, uh, 2002, when a special envoy John Kerry went to Pyongyang uh, to be told that uh, North Korea has already become a nuclear weapon state. Uh, and uh, until that time, uh, we were only talking about plutonium, but uh, we started talking about also HEU. Uh, and of course, uh, we uh, got started six party talks. Uh, until some time ago, uh, I was supposed to be ahead of the uh, Japanese delegation uh, uh, at the time, and uh, no six-party talks held. So uh, I uh, didn't uh, function uh, anything as a head of the uh, six-party talks on behalf of the Japanese government. Um, the, uh, but all in all, uh, what we see uh, is uh, over these uh, uh, 20 years or so more, you know, Frankly uh, speaking, the very situation concerning uh, missile, nuclear, and for us human rights, uh, in particular abductions, um, again ups and downs, but uh, in general situation seems to have been greatly worsened uh, for them to be uh, declaring and uh, at the same time, uh, as a matter of fact, they seem to have become nuclear weapon state. How much they are capable uh, is something in question. 
Um, then um, everybody uh, has been talking about uh, what we should uh, be able to do uh, in deter or in uh, letting them to change their courses, uh, but uh, we are not able to do that. Uh, the, I, don't know, I don't think I can disclose to you the substantive sort of you know, discussions uh, uh, within the uh, 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 G7 leaders uh, in Isashima. They discussed just a bit about this uh, subject matter, uh, but not uh, in a lengthy manner, because uh, when uh, my Prime Minister led the way, everybody said, oh yes, I agree with you fully, and full stop. Uh, and uh, the question, of course, went on. Based upon that uh, uh, recognition and full uh, agreement, what uh, should we do? Of course, we uh, very much would like uh, China to do something further. We very much would like to do all or to ask all the members of the international community uh, to implement uh, uh, the most currently uh, adopted uh, uh, Security Council uh, Resolution 2270. Um, and all said, uh, the, uh, this is not uh, uh, disclosing the uh, G7 leadership's uh, conversation, but uh, um, not only single person, but uh, a number of uh, persons told me that we seem to be dealing with uh, a leader who needs uh, psychiatric uh, treatment. Um, maybe, but uh, I'm quite certain that uh, people gathering around this table, no one, uh, if there would be any, I very much would like uh, him or her, uh, what uh, the meeting was like, but I would understand that no one gathering here had met with uh, Kim Jong-un personally. No one even touched upon uh, their inside uh, leadership. Uh, and um, as if uh, we are touching this part and we are guessing this part and we are thinking this part and saying that uh, here is uh, a young leader who needs a psychiatric uh, treatment, but no one no one meets with him. Uh, no one talks, uh, uh, talks to him directly. I don't know. Uh, he may be a sharp leader. He may be uh, somebody who needs a uh, psychiatric treatment. Um, the, uh, but one thing uh, for sure is, as I said at the outset, that everybody should agree that something must be done to change the course of this, what they call uh, Pyongyang uh, policy. Uh, uh, no one uh, would uh, let them allow to go for nuclear. Uh, not only in the sense of uh, we have to reserve uh, the regime of NPT, but for us, and primarily for uh, our neighbor region, and for the international community altogether, I don't think uh, we uh, very much would like to uh, swallow the idea of uh, DPRK being a really capable nuclear weapon state, particularly for Japan, uh, particularly for DPRK, uh, for um, uh, ROK, and particularly for uh, ROC, and particularly for uh, U US. So we form a very sort of you know, strong uh, kind of you know, de facto uh, allied uh, mechanism among Seoul, Tokyo, Washington. Though sometimes Seoul, Tokyo has been faced with some of the uh, difficult sort of political questions, and yet uh, at no single time, um, none of us uh, in Seoul, Tokyo, Washington does believe that uh, this uh, tripartite uh, 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 kind of you know, coalition or a de facto uh, 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 united front uh, uh, is meaningless. Now, uh, being faced with an uh, even worsening situation, uh, the presumably, uh, 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 to say the least, uh, two things uh, uh, can be um, rather comfortably uh, 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 said to you as uh, food for thought for the um, uh, 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 discussions to be followed. One, even more important uh, for uh, uh, Japan, ROK, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, cooperation uh, to give them uh, more pressure uh, as well as uh, to let us open uh, the way for dialogue uh, so that uh, we can both uh, employ the uh, 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 pressure as well as dialogue. Second, 
as I said uh, uh, in the course of my uh, uh, conversation, uh, China's role is even uh, becoming greater and greater. Everybody knows that uh, more than 90% of trade is between Pyongyang and uh, Beijing. Uh, and uh, if uh, the uh, 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 thorough uh, implementation of uh, what we agreed uh, uh, within the, uh, the framework of the uh, uh, United Nations Security Council uh, uh, two months ago or some, some uh, quite recently uh, 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 with the number of 2270, this is the first time uh, when we stepped into uh, the restriction of uh, trading goods except uh, luxurious, uh, luxurious uh, good uh, in the previous, uh, previous uh, uh, Security Council resolution. So we seem to get into a new phase because of the uh, worsening situation. Now, how much, based upon this, you know, uh, 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 Japan, ROK, and U.S. Uh, uh, closer kind of an alliance uh, against uh, DPRK, uh, and plus uh, uh, more important role being played uh, by Chinese, uh, how much we are going to just get. Uh, and I'm, I'm not that much uh, optimistic because of the past uh, two decades. The past two decades show only the situation is getting worse. Uh, we must stop this. Everybody agrees that. But how? Uh, then uh, 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 I think um, uh, my first initial sort of you know, uh, uh, introductory remark uh, is short enough, uh, uh, Mr. Chair David. <laughs> so I uh, try to stop at this particular moment, and uh, I have to, you know, uh, um, uh, convey the message from my government, uh, uh, which is written in this paper. Uh, but I'll do that later. Thank you. <laughs> Shinsuke, thank you very much. I'm not certain throwing away your notes. Hi, it's no memo. So no. え、そして特に北朝鮮に対する抑止力について、いろんな国権なる専門家とお話ができるよろしくお願いします。今年はいろんな台湾が、そして台湾に来まして、例えば初めてロードシャー会議の田面の36年ぶりの会議が開かれまして、
The security of South Korea, where more than one a million foreign nationals reside, obviously will be uh, threatened. And also increases in nuclear proliferation and the temptation of black market trading will be a direct uh, threat to global uh, securities. From the perspective of, of the international security order, the international non-proliferation regimes will meet its demise due to North Korea, uh, the only nations to have conducted a nuclear threat in 21st centuries. And every nation will have to ponder on how to uh, secure its own survival. This means a situation which calls for a new international security order might arise. Unfortunately, the international community's uh, response uh, to the North Korean nuclear threat has not been successful, as uh, he eloquently uh, pointed out. It's now uh, clear that conducting business as usual will not be sufficient uh, to deter North Korea's uh, nuclear threat. Next, I'll speak about the sanctions against North Korea. The United Nations has created a resolution calling for a sanctions uh, stronger than ever uh, since the North Korean nuclear issue first arose. While some effect of the sanctions are being observed, some are questioning the efficacy of the sanctions. Regardless of the effectiveness of the sanctions, North Korea will not learn its lessons if, as in the past, the consequences of not complying with its obligations under UN Security Council resolutions are insufficiently painful and nothing more than a slap on the wrist. The international community must punish North Korea to the extent that an internal discussions regarding its strategic choices uh, may be sparked. I'm suggesting that we abandon our past approach which has failed to deter North Korea's nuclear program and take the path untaken. I anticipate that more seamless sanctions closing and reducing North Korea's external relations, limiting North Korea's workers from working abroad, interdicting North Korea's illegal activities, and addressing North Korea's human rights issues will be reviewed. Next, I will address the issue of resuming conversations with uh, North Korea. I admit that somewhere down the road, conversations will be needed. At this juncture, however, a unified and principled response from the international community is more important than simply stressing the need for conversations. To resume conversations, North Korea must at least announce a clear position with uh, regard to denuclearizations and act on their will. Since North Korea's uh, recent call for a conversation to not include any content regarding denuclearizations, it seems that it's merely an attempt to relax international coordination. Paradoxically, it can also be evidence that North Korea is impacted by the sanctions levied by international communities. If you respond in a principled manner with patience, I anticipate that we may create an opportunity for a beginning denuclearization process. If there are, two, if there are no teeth to the punishment of North Korea violating its obligations, we can expect no sub substantive result even though conversation resumes. This is a lesson that we have learned um, uh, through the nuclear negotiations with Iran. After most nuclear issue came to the fore, the discussions regarding the relationship between denuclearization and the peace treaty have been raised. Recently, North Korea have been consistently requesting a peace treaty without making its position on denuclearization, uh, denuclearization clear. Seeing as North Korea is continuously threatening the peace and stability of the region through nuclear and missile provocations, we feel neither their sincerity nor their will for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Discussions on the peace in the absence of sincerity and will for peace will not slow down the denuclearization process and ultimately give North Korea more time to advance its nuclear capabilities. 
Also, judging from North Korea's uh, track record, if you had concurrent negotiations for a denuclearization and peace treaty, North Korea will constantly threaten to walk away from denuclearization chamber uh, on the grounds that the peace treaty talks are not proceeding in, the, in their favor. For these reasons, we think that the recent North Korean proposal for a peace treaty was planned in order to neutralize the international community's uh, solidarities in responding to North Korea and to relax the strengthening sanctions uh, framework. My last point is about how to resolve North Korea's uh, security concerns. Many experts, like you, um, have emphasized the need to resolve North Korea's uh, uh, security concerns to solve North Korea's nuclear issues. Even without referring to the uh, security dilemma theories, these arguments accept, are accepted as uh, valid. As such, multiple agreements, including the September uh, 19th Joint Declaration, reflect a form of security concerns resolution roadmaps. The Republic of Korea government uh, has also been clear of its peaceful uh, unification policy based on reconciliation and cooperation. But if resolving North Korea's concerns means continuation of North Korea's current regimes, no nations, including the Republic of Korea and the United States, will not be able to ensure um, the, uh, these outcomes. So in my humble view, uh, the ultimate resolution of the North Korea's uh, security concern can be achieved through fixing its in inherent internal incons inconsistencies including taking care of the livelihood of its, of its citizens and acting as a responsible member of the international communities. North Korea mentions the nuclear threat and hostile policy from the U.S. for, a, for its motivation behind nuclear development. However, uh, very few uh, would agree that a democratically elected government in the Republic of Korea and the United States is planning a military attack and nuclear threat against North Korea, which particularly borders China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yoon. Um, we'll move, um, I mean, full of um, big issues for us to get hold of in question time. Um, Colonel Liu, over to you, please. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, all the speakers here. Uh, on the topic of this session is containing the North Korea threat first, I would say that I prefer DPRK to North Korea. When it comes to the security situation in Northeast Asia, the DPRK nuclear issue is the most prominent one that not only affects the general security environment of this region, but uh, also poses a real challenge to the entire international non-proliferation regime. With its fourth nuclear test and several new missile launches, DPRK once again triggered the instability of Korean Peninsula. I have three observations. First, DPRK has been adamantly pursuing its nuclear program. Based on some open technical resources, DPRK has made great progress in its nuclear weaponization program, especially during the stalemate of six-party talks. And the seventh party national congress of DPRK demonstrates Kim Jong-un's confidence in leading its party and governing the country with its policy of simultaneously pursuing economic and nuclear development. Secondly, bringing DPRK back to the negotiation table seems to be the only way out. At present, all parties concerned have very limited policy options to deal with the DPRK nuclear problem. Although a more strict UN resolution 2270 would be a possible choice, to some degree, sanction does work on some of the cases, such as Iran. But for DPRK, I don't think it will be very successful. Since the year of 1993, there have been nine UN resolutions on DPRK nuclear and missile developments.
that they are largely unsuccessful in preventing DPRK from advancing its nuclear weapons. When it comes to DPRK isolated and weak but independent in its domestic development, including national defense, I'm afraid that we cannot hold a high expectation on the effectiveness of the new situation or new sanction. On the other hand, if we don't talk to them, they will continue with its nuclear program. If we talk to them, there is at least a chance of stopping their nuclear pro program. And there were historical instances of DPRK prepared to trade their nuclear program for economic benefits or even the regime survival. Thirdly, China handles the DPRK nuclear issue in a, respons in a responsible way. Some say that China has not been doing enough to deal with the DPRK nuclear issue. Their main argument is that since China is the biggest provider of assistance to DPRK, if China can exert enough pressure, DPRK will have to give in and abandon its nuclear weapons. But this is simply not a truth. As a matter of fact, China's determination to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula is no less resolute than ROK, the United States, and other countries concerned. We certainly do not want to have a fourth nuclear neighbor. It is true that China and the DPRK can enjoy some traditional friendly relationship. But China's influence on DPRK is limited. Why I say that? Number one, DPRK is a sovereign state. Given China's policy of non-intervention in their internal affairs in other countries, China can only persuade instead of coerce DPRK to abandon its nuclear weapons. China's message to DPRK has been very clear. The possession of nuclear weapons will not bring security to DPRK not in China's interest and not in the interest of the international community. Number two, some historical events have indicated that sanction and coercion or even the use of force cannot eventually solve the problems, and the cases in point are Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. Number three, the Chinese government and the military have been strictly abiding by the relevant UN Security Council resolutions on DPRK, including the very recent one. However, China believes that sanction is not the objective, but one of the approaches to resolving the problem. So what China can do is persuasion and negotiation, rather than sanction and coercion. Such efforts include China's timely adjustment of its policy towards DPRK, China's attempts to encourage DPRK to de develop its economy and increase its revenue, and moreover, China's exercise of strict auditing of items that are not related to economy and people's livelihood, according to the UN resolutions. In the most uh, recent a high-level meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Rin Su-yang, Vice Chairman of the Working Party of Korean Central Committee, President Xi re-emphasized that he wished the people of the DPRK greater success in their endeavors related to the economy, standard of living, and socialism. So China, the United States, and other countries concerned have a lot of common interests, and uh, in uh, ha uh, sorry, a lot of common interests in the Korean Peninsula. We should work together to resume talks and reduce tension. We should and we can cooperate further to tackle this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. So dialogue is. Better than George or rather than World War, I think, is what yeah. Churchill would have said. Yeah. Okay, and lastly, um, Aidan Foster Carter, please. And I should say, Aidan wrote um, the piece that you, I hope, have had a chance to look at. Um, there he is. He came ready to publicize it. Yeah. So over to you, Aidan, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Well, spot the odd one out. <laughs> I uh, am very, very honored and privileged uh, to be here. Um, 
along with three representatives of the, the governments of the three countries uh, most actively concerned as neighbours in, in, in the region. Um, I am not from the region. I am not a diplomat. Perhaps I am an undiplomat. Um, and I have one advantage, well, maybe I have that gives me a, a certain freedom, or I hope not irresponsibility. And I do have the advantage that the rest of us only have eight minutes, me included, eight minutes maximum. But I have 22 pages as well. Uh, I was honored to be asked to write the book. And of course, there's a lot in there, and I won't be able to summarize it. Do, do please, please read it. Um, what I th thought I could best do with my time is uh, talk about some of what I've got in there, but I think I'm probably going to have to cut that short. Also try to update some key elements that have occurred since it went to press. It did go to press quite recently. Dare I confess, my original deadline from IISS was November. Imagine, <laughs> we'd have missed all the fun if I'd finished by November. We were constantly revising right up to and including the ROK general election. I think of April was about the last thing we actually got in. Um, and there are one or two offcuts as well that, uh, that I had to leave out that perhaps might be able to fit in. I should say, as you'll be aware, um, if you have had a chance to read it, um, and uh, you'll be aware from what I, I'm about to say, I find myself slightly swimming against the current of um, much that has happened, particularly in, in Western capitals uh, this, this, this year, and I'm grateful to have had the chance to be that little bit contrarian. Um, in a reference that people from Washington will get, and maybe others won't, it seems as if, and do tell him if you know him, that Josh Stanton died and went to heaven. Um, somebody, you know, somebody, hawks are in the ascendant, and in a way, as a social scientist, if I could stand back and detach, it's a very interesting experiment, because we haven't been in this position before. I think we haven't had such hardline sanctions, we haven't had such a reversion to the stick. Well, let us see how it ends. Um, if I'm a little uncertain, it's because I have two criteria, which I should clarify, though I hope they would be obvious. Uh, my criteria are, first of all, in the short run, does a given action, whether by North Korea or by anybody else, uh, raise or lower risk in Korea and Northeast Asia? And secondly, for the long term, does a given course of action, whether a specific policy or a more general trajectory, uh, make, us, make it likelier that we'll resolve, or at least contain, it probably is about containment, the, the, the North Korea problem. Um, so yes, the year began with a bang, a double whammy. Uh, the North Koreans made it clear they're not about to follow Iran or Myanmar or Cuba, all in their various different ways coming in from the cold. Um, in the chapter I use, I possibly coin the phrase North Korea fatigue. The bang did wake us all up, didn't it? Uh, would it be fair to say that in many capitals, the North Korea issue had kind of gone off the boil or gone onto the back burner? There are good reasons for that. First of all, it's so bloody intractable, to be technical for a moment. Um, there are no very good answers. And secondly, there are usually other crises which are more urgent for the US and for other governments. Nonetheless, the threat is still there, and it's not just a nuclear threat. There's a whole range of other things. In an earlier IISS publication, I, I wrote about some of those. In the chapter I go through, there's a certain sort of chronicling aspect, which I'm obviously not going to do now, basically covering the Kim Jong-un era, the various uh, two nuclear tests in his time and also two of these missile launches. There are the cyber issues. And then I state something which kind of should be obvious, but we don't seem to sort of put it this way. Why does the North Koreans get away with it? Um, partly because there is a prioritization problem among interlocutors. It's almost impossible, maybe it is impossible, to get everybody completely on the same page. I remember long ago at a conference in Japan, a senior Chinese diplomat, when somebody rather enthusiastically from Washington said, you know, we're all on the same page on this one, um, said, no, it's perhaps convergence. But I mean, for example, in, and the national interests vary, obviously. It's different if you're China than, than if you're South Korea or Japan. And in South Korea and Japan, governments change. Um, we are told, you know, that the current government in South Korea will, will not last forever. And in April, it received a very unexpected rebuff. President Park no longer has a majority. Now that, um, in Parliament. Okay, that election was not fought on North Korea. But it renders it more likely that the next president will be a liberal. Some people may remember the Sunshine Policy. That ran for 10 years. Uh, it changed. 
should we say sunset is where we are now, uh, we, get a, we might get a version of sunshine again. So it is quite difficult to get everyone on the same page. Right now, people are probably closer to the same page than they've been for some time. But still not exactly on the same page, because as far as I can see, and again, I stand ready to be pre-corrected, um, even as the South Korea, Japan, US trilateralism uh, strengthens again, which is fine, um, it remains the case that China and Russia though in no simple or straightforward sense allies of the DPRK anymore, retain the view, and I think are going to go on retaining the view, though it's always possible that their view might change if the North Koreans annoy them enough as well, um, that there is a thing that is worse than having the nasty, noxious nuclear neighbor on your doorstep, and that is having the collapse of the nasty, no noxious, sorry, too many ends there, noxious nuclear neighbor on your doorstep. As I understand it, for China and for Russia, particularly for China, both the process of any North Korean collapse or instability, and secondly, to distinguish the outcome of it, what they like the outcome, are at the moment unpalatable. And if you think that calculus will change, then the situation, the prospects are, are actually very different. Um, I think, I've got one more thing from the thing, and I'll just do the quick update. I think we ignored the domestic dimension. I must admit, when, when the North Koreans set off their big bang, their non-hydrogen bomb in January, I thought, you may say complacently, I thought, oh, there they go again. Were you surprised? Was anyone in this room surprised? Annoyed? But surprised? No, come on, you weren't. They do that. They do it every three years, and they were obviously going to do it this year because they have a party congress. And among other things, I'm not to deny that obviously every nuclear test gets them closer, or the, the deliverability issues, the weapons issues, and all that, but the domestic political function, there was going to be a Big Bang. There was going to be a satellite launch. Um, so, but I genuinely don't understand the question I put to Minister Han, and he answered all my other questions, and I thank him, but he didn't really answer this one, is, is what changed between 2013 and 2016? President Park has lost patience. Everybody has finally had it with North Korea. Uh, if I can be sociological for a moment, because that's my discipline or indiscipline, it's a kind of essentialist view. There is North Korea. It never changes. Uh, nothing happens there. And they've done it again. And this time we've had enough. And we're really going to punish them because we're fed up. All very understandable. But maybe we could also say, well, actually, they have second generation leadership change. He's still quite new on his fourth, fifth year now. He's having a party congress, which is kind of interesting. The currency within that domestic regime is loyalty and fidelity. He imposes it on everyone else, and he can't break out of it either. So I can't actually see how at this stage he could not have done those things. Anyway, you can see where that argument might lead. And if I can just commit one more act of sociology, it probably doesn't happen very often at this thing. Could we say the DPRK is, in a sense, a prisoner of its own discourse? It's actually it's so hard, even on the economy, they don't seem to be able to find a way to talk about things. And they're digging themselves in the nuclear trench. And, of course, it makes it incredibly difficult for the rest of us. But I just worry uh, that policies that respond to them directly in the way that in a way they ask for and that dig them further into that trench maybe aren't going to actually get us out of it. But I realize that time is, 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 is short. Very quick update. The Party Congress, incredibly disappointing. Reaffirm nukes forever. Nothing sensible on the economy. Um, those 120 Western journalists in Pyongyang, at least some of them must have had a, a bit of Korean, but it was left to Rudiger Frank uh, from Austria to find a lovely quote, which I hope uh, was put to Mr. Ri Su Young when he visited. There was, did you know that he, he, Kim Jong-un talked about the filthy wind of, this is a quote, the filthy wind of bourgeois liberty and reform and openness blowing in our neighborhood? I wonder who he meant. Um, that wasn't very nice, was it? Um, but, and then nothing new on the economy. The two new things that have happened, of course, yes, um, Ri Su Young has just been to Beijing. That, that was going to happen, wasn't it? I mean, they, it was so anomalous. You can't have a half forever, this lack of, of, of high-level contacts. Um, it's too early to know what to make of it, but um, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times, some of you saw it, which was written just a teeny bit too early. Um, Jane Pellez, is that how she says it? Um, fine article. He'd arrived, he'd met the party guy, he hadn't yet President Xi, and various worthies were quoted, American and Chinese, saying, oh, President Xi can't possibly meet him because... A, he has said, according to KCNA, that we are going to be nuclear forever. And B, they've just fired another of these wretched Musudans. Admittedly, I always think of Queen, another one bites the dust. It's, it's really good that they never seem to work. But, but, she, but President Xi did meet him. Um, I'm very interested in what signal that sends. I think he probably had to. He wasn't about to send Kim Jong-un's representative away with a flea in his ear. 
One other thing quickly to mention, of course, with this week we've had, and I must get the jargon right here, the United States Treasury Department has designated the DPRK as a whole as a jurisdiction of primary money laundering concern uh, under Section 311 of the Patriot Act. Did I get that right? I think in plain English that means you bastards were coming after you. Um, it means, I'm sorry to be technical for a moment there, uh, it means in principle, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, the possibility of applying much tighter screws financially to secondary targets. Um, I had an interesting Twitter exchange with Victor Jar about this, so I asked, it's amazing what you can get into 140 characters if you try, um, will the US really target Chinese banks that do business with DPRK? Victor replied, we don't have to target Chinese banks. They will self-regulate if the choice is North Korea or access to the U.S. financial system. My reply to him would be, and my reply in anticipation, which is in the chapter here, um, is given that the U.S. PRC bilateral relationship is large and many-sided and important, and that oh, President Obama is winding down in his final months, then when there are high-level meetings, like the one that is imminent um, in, in Beijing next week, um, is the whole USPRC relationship really going to be driven or even majorly driven by the North Korea issue? And, and I just wonder. We'll, we'll wait and see. My time is almost up, so we're going to have the off-cuts now. Um, Hilaire Belloc, I wanted to quote, the American, sorry, the British, what am I saying? The British or French origin humorist. Um, they, I wanted to put in, but IISS doesn't do this sort of thing, the quote, uh, they answered as they took their fees, there is no cure for this disease, which is rather pessimistic, I suppose. And thanks to William Chung of IISS, um, I, I've got another Hilaire Belloc. He quoted the, the line about um, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. And I would like to modernize that for the 21st century. It all boils down to who has got the atom bomb and who has not. I think General Richards alluded to that. My positively final thing, and probably my most contrarian yet, and I'm going to actually read this out because it's something that I wrote. Um, North Korea is an infuriating menace. I hope there's no doubt about that in this room. But it is reassuringly solitary. In a world where we are also menaced by much else, particularly by a toxic, perverted universalism, which turns alienated youth from many countries into mass murderers and rapists, thinking that they have religion on their side. The DPRK is very different. It stands alone and apart. It is the non-Islamic state. It is the un -Daesh. Nobody flocks to their banner, except a few harmless oddballs. This was put rather well in the film Team America World Police, but I'm not about to quote it. Um, North Korea is so lipsistic. Fascist, not communist, more narcissist than Nazi. It has no plans for world domination. It must know that defeat, it does know that defeating South Korea is no longer realistic. But it does feel very unsafe, and this has been mentioned. The fates of Iraq, Syria, and especially Libya recall how the US used to urge Kim Jong-il to emulate that sensible Colonel Gaddafi in surrendering WMD, can hardly encourage Kim Jong-un to give up what he may feel is his sole guarantee against sharing such an end. None of this is to justify the horrible place in any way at all. It's just to say that at some level, I think we have to have the other side. And my positively final word, I'm not against some, the waving of a very large stick at North Korea. I just think at some point there's going to have to be an overarching strategy which also contains a fairly large carrot. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Aidan. Um, and I think your last couple of points in particular uh, is where I would um, be as a soldier. Um, if you're going to wave a big stick, uh, you've got to be prepared to use it. And uh, it doesn't seem to me that um, we've got much closer to that, uh, probably wisely. So we've heard a lot from our panel, um, but with variations on a theme, uh, we have been given give or take a formula of more of the same. Uh, I don't think I'm being unfair, but there is a consensus that this can't go on. So um, I haven't got very far in that respect, arguably. So it's over to you guys now um, to be a little bit more provocative. Um, put your, if you could put your name plate up on the vertical, uh, I will try to read it um, and bear with me. Um, Keep your questions, please, uh, short and pithy, uh, or your statements if it's not a question. But let's try and involve our panel. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, you. I'll take two or three at a time only. Uh, Mr. Nelson, thank you.
Oh, there it is. The button was right in front of me. That's why I couldn't see it. Um, sort of like a solution in North Korea, perhaps. Um, we haven't talked about what is the dilemma that certainly in D.C. we talk about all the time. And that is, is there an acceptable way to negotiate with North Korea the, uh, to freeze or curtail their inevitable march towards eventually a workable nuclear weapon, a workable ICBM, and other things we all don't want. Is there some way to do that that does not give them de facto real recognition as a nuclear power? We haven't talked about that today, and yet uh, that's what we spend most of the time talking about in D.C. How the hell do we do this? And the, and the conclusion we get is we can't do it for political reasons, but also very practical ones. Uh, what happens to the NPT, what, you know, uh, the Iranians, et cetera, et cetera. So perhaps our panelists could talk about uh, th this immediate tactical issue with major strategic implications. How do we talk to these guys without basically accepting them as a nuclear power? And then what the hell we, do we do? So thank you. Pick up from the, yeah, I'll start with you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, a reference was made this morning to the article Secretary Carter wrote about 10 years ago. I'll just quote one sentence from it. As we entered into negotiations to shut down Yongbyon, we made our willingness to use military force crystal clear to the North Koreans by positioning forces to strike Yongbyon and reinforcing our military units that were deployed to defend South Korea against an onslaught from the north. Uh, with all these military people here, sir, is there still a military option? Uh, and if so, would it work? Um, sorry, Mr. Tagliaki? Thank you very much. Uh, I was intrigued by uh, a moderator's uh, reminder of uh, what uh, containment meant. As uh, you said, it is between detente and rollback. But if uh, what we are seeking with uh, North Korea is containment, as Mr. Nelson sort of suggested, it's not that difficult. I mean, to prevent things getting worse from what we have right now, probably if we recognize uh, DPRK as the uh, nuclear state, and start the negotiating uh, peace treaty, they probably wouldn't do much more, which means uh, we succeed in containment. But I'm not advocating this. But I'm not trying to make this point because I don't think containment is good enough. I think we do need a rollback. CVID is a rollback. And uh, I think uh, something uh, like that uh, should be pursued. And in this regard, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Colonel Liu about uh, China's influence on North Korea. You said that uh, previous sanctions uh, did not work, and uh, what we should do is not uh, any more sanctions on North Korea. But I think uh, it is a common belief among many specialists that uh, previous sanctions did not work because China did not practice, practice it uh, uh, seriously. And uh, I'd like to hear your reaction to this, uh, what I regard to be the generally accepted uh, judgment. Thank you. Okay, um, excellent. Um, we'll have one more. Uh, Mr. Pollock, please. Thank you. Um, North Korea, or the DPRK, as our Chinese colleague calls it, has, is not a new issue. Indeed, um, I would note for the record that uh, deterrence, if we can speak in terms of deterrence, uh, has existed, to be sure, somewhat uneasily on the Korean Peninsula since the Korean armistice was signed 62 or 63 years ago. Um, this, therefore, was deterrence prior to North Korea being a nuclear weapon state, and the reasons are pretty self-evident. Uh, it's the question of the implications of the use of force. This has been studied and studied again and studied again, and the conclusions from uh, senior uh, U.S. military commanders has been consistent over time that in some sense you could imagine, quote-unquote, 
winning a war, but the cost would be so acute because of the inherent vulnerabilities in the Republic of Korea by its location, by things that you can do absent the use of nuclear weapons. In other words, you, you, so I don't want to dwell on that too much, but, but um, let, me, let me put a cautionary element in, and forgive me for indulging in a bit of hist history. Um, North Korea says many things. It says it to its own people. It says it to the world. In fact, there are lots of elements in their behavior that are quite predictable. So, for example, if we believe everything that uh, young Mr. Kim says, they are now a thermonuclear armed state uh, with a capacity to hit Washington, D.C. We all know that they don't, so let's get first things first. Uh, their threats or their ability to deliver nuclear weapons uh, would be, if, if it were to be realized, would be first and primarily against its immediate neighbors. Uh, however much young Kim might dream of something larger, he's not there. He simply is not there. Um, North Korea tests a nuclear weapon about every three and a half years. Uh, there are constraints on their testing program that may be a function in part of the inadequacy of their resource base or the costs that are associated every time they test another nuclear weapon where the sanctions ratchet up much more fully and the same thing would happen yet again because there are things that have been foregone um, to this point. So I think it's very, very important, even as this represents a deep and very worrying concern, and I defer to no one uh, in terms of my own worries here about what this could imply. Uh, the question is one of time and of trajectories. Um, there are two trajectories that are dominant here in North Korea. One, of course, is the rate at which they could, in theory, um, assemble uh, and build a credible nuclear deterrent, because they do not, in my view, possess such a deterrent right now, at least as we conceptualize what a nuclear deterrent looks like, something that you know, any of the established nuclear powers have. That is to say, something you put on a missile, either launched from undersea or on land or other, other things. Uh, they would like us to believe that those capabilities exist, uh, but um, frankly, they really don't. Uh, so I'm not saying this to be indulge in happy talk about North Korea. What I would be much more alarmed about, and this is where it intersects with the question of the sustainability of the North Korean system. Now, we know that the predictions of the demise of North Korea come and go. They've done this now ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, I like to, to say that when I wake up in the morning and I turn on my computer, they're still there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the question now is the imposing of costs on North Korea. I don't think anyone believes that the sanctions, even if they are enhanced, is a cure-all. They're just not. Uh, it's the question of whether you can compel North Korea to make some choices that to this point it has not. And how does that intersect with whether or not the system itself has a long-term future. Um, so what I worry about, uh, and uh, as my good friend Chris Nelson reminds everyone, I put in somewhat uh, evocative terms in this week's uh, Economist, um, that North Korea engages in its nuclear weapons development with another and much darker scenario in mind. And that is under circumstances where the system is losing its cohesion if there is an impulse to go in somehow because of the risks that would be entailed here and to, in effect, capture whatever they have in the way of nuclear capabilities, North Korea has an inherent capability to set off nuclear weapons, not on the basis of something that you put on a missile, but something that, in effect, says to the outside world, and perhaps the United States in particular, that if you come in expect to see mushroom clouds, and will the United States or anyone else go in on that basis? So I throw that out just to say that let us not give North Korea credit 
for what it has not done and has not achieved. Let us bear in mind that they're very determined and ultimately they may get there. We should make it as difficult as possible for them to achieve that, deny them legitimacy if we possibly can. Those are inherent dilemmas. But what I can say, and this would be my last comment, um, that there is at, at present much more of a consensus message among all the affected parties and the idea is to sustain and build on that consensus and not enable North Korea, as it has done so long and so skillfully, is to maneuver in the seams, to look for openings among all the affected parties. Um, so that is going to be the challenge, first and foremost, I think, of what I'll call a united front uh, to forestall North Korea's further nuclear weapons development. Uh, but uh, let's... Um, Let's pay careful heed to what they do or do not have based on what we do or do not know. Uh, and that, of course, is a difficult thing to do, and we can't just simply assume magically that they're not going to get there. Can but you draw to a close, please? please? Anyhow, thank okay. you. Um, right. I, thank you very much for that. Um, there are some questions in that. I just want to go right to left, if I may, to pick up the ones. It seems to me the real issue is, are we beyond military, uh, a military option? Uh, I have to say, as someone looking at it from not a great uh, point of expertise, but some experience of these things, that sounds like more of the same. Um, so we're in, um, uh, we're stymied, arguably. So, um, and I'm not advocating a military option. I think uh, Chris Nelson's point was uh, absolutely spot on. May I? Um, I'll once again try to be uh, uh, precise and concise. One, the, uh, uh, do we have any rooms uh, for us to uh, recognize as a de facto basis uh, DPLK new status? Uh, and uh, do we have some options uh, for uh, use of force, uh, but, uh, possibly under Article 42, uh, uh, Chapter 7, or um, outside of the uh, UN Charter's framework? Now, I try to address uh, 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 first uh, on the second point. Um, maybe I understand that uh, this is based upon Chatham House rule, so uh, what I'm going to say I wouldn't be supposed to be go outside of this room. That's why I'm saying this. If I were Netanyahu, maybe the answer is yes, but I'm not. Um, the, uh, if the option of uh, use of force uh, is the option, the uh, situation is much easier. But I don't think we have that option. And this is something that every one of us are concerned in the neighbor, including ROK, PRC, us, U.S., everybody, uh, uh, should, uh, should be fully in agreement. Second, do we have any room for us to recognize, as Chris uh, mentioned, uh, even though de facto basis a new uh, status uh, of uh, DPRK? The answer is absolutely no. One, as a matter of principle, mind you what was said by uh, Barack Obama, Shinzo Abe in Hiroshima, uh, John Kerry, Kishida Fumio in Hiroshima. We are seeking world without nuke. Uh, of course, not tomorrow, but that's the, 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 the ultimate aim. That said, can we say, can we be in a position to say, okay, uh, we are saying yes to DPLK, at least for the time being, de facto basis, uh, as a nuke status? Second, that is too much for us in terms of the real danger and real security threat. So, both in terms of general philosophy as well as practical security reason, the answer is totally no. Thank you. I haven't heard a solution, though, but very well made point, Do uh, Mr. Yoon. Um, basically, I agree with uh, Mr. Sugiyama on most points. Firstly, uh, let me also uh, be precisely <clears throat> saying that, firstly, um, let me ask the same question. Is there any room to accept North Korea's nuclear power? Uh, theoretically and legally, it's impossible. And also, if we think the um, unpredictable nature of North Korea leadership, as well as it's a, a bad track record, it might be a, a more dangerous word. Number two, 
can we think about the military options uh, to resolve North Korea's nuclear crisis? Theoretically, we can do that, but realistically, it's impossible. Uh, thirdly, um, there's wide a, a convergence of ideas on the importance of Chinese uh, you know, role in resolving this nuclear crisis. We expect that uh, China could uh, more a constructive role to, you know, to contain North Korea's uh, nuclear gamble. Uh, fourthly, um, if we allow North Korea to possess nuclear weapons, deterrence, uh, you know, de deterring North Korea's ambitions will be more uh, difficult agendas. And, and I agree with uh, the other colleagues that sanction is not cure all, but this is, not time, uh, this is the proper time to think about the uh, release of sanctions, because basically because North Korea do not accept any dialogue uh, which is conditions, uh, you know, to participate uh, the dialogue as a non-nuclear weapon state. Thank you. Very good. So um, China's the solution, Colonel Liu. <laughs> China's solution simply we have very consistent uh, policies towards uh, DPRK's nuclear problem and the most important one in which we share the common interest with all parties concerned is that we support a Korean Peninsula without nuclear weapons. So that's why we call our policy as denuclearization of Korean Peninsula. So I agree with uh, you theoretically and uh, legally. We do not support such kind of uh, possibility to have a nuclear have DPRK. Uh, for for the influence of uh, 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 Chi uh, for the Chinese influence on uh, DPRK, uh, I think. Uh, I will respond to uh, Takaki's uh, question. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, China's uh, policy choices are quite limited. But China has tried uh, its best to help DPRK uh, to gain its uh, economic development and to encourage this small and weak country back to the negotiation table. For the sanction problem, uh, I think also as I mentioned, China has implemented its uh, uh, UN, re uh, the UN resolutions strictly. Uh, if you think China has not strictly implemented the resolution, please give me a simple example and I will get back to you. I also have an example to you. Um, even in uh, 2013, when the media uh, showed the photos of the specialized uh, flow foaming machine in DPRK, some experts found that it's very advanced uh, machine for the uh, HEU uh, uh, production. And uh, after the specialized analysis, this uh, machine came from European countries. So my question is when some people or people from uh, neighboring countries suspected China's implementation of the resolution, can you pay much attention to other possible channels? And China has its resolution and the decision to have a denuclearized Korean Peninsula. China has showed its decision, very strong decision, to denuclearize uh, Korean Peninsula, especially DPRK. China has said that, and China will do that. That's my answer. Thank you. Well done. Um, Aiden, <coughs> I don't have a quick hold. as you can. I will. No, that's, that, that's better. There is a risk on the nuclear, nuclear recognition or whatever. Obviously, one understands totally all the, the broad Kantian, Port and Courage, Les Autres reasons why for the NPT and everything. You can't recognize them. The other side of the coin, though, is how do we avoid being in the situation of the emperor's new clothes? where the little child says, but hey, they've got the bomb. Um, I don't know how you, how you square that, and I don't know if there can be rollback. The genie is out of the bottle, uh, is it not? Um, I just came across an article that was from January by former Secretary Bill Perry, where I think he, 
he says as much, and also, of course, laments that, you know, they were so close in 2000, people may have different views about that, they're actually getting it never to come out of the bottle. That's one thing. Secondly, can I have a slightly surprise, only what can we do about it, the military option, can I ha surprise myself with a warmonger moment? I am not a weapons person, but given the fuss specifically about SLBM, about the risk of, you know, the, what a game changer it would be if they ever had a submarine, hang on, we, we presumably can watch them building submarines unless the whole thing is deep in caves and there's a finite number of ports that they can set out from. If it ever came to that point, and God forbid, it would be a lot easier going after the subs and the bases, wouldn't it? End of warmonger moment. Hypothetical, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm keen to get a, another round in and obviously our, our panel needs to respond. So I'm going to, I know uh, I've got one at the very back, Charles... Uh, would you like to start and then I'll work up this way. Can you keep it short and pithy, uh, no long statements so we can get all of you through? Charles. Yeah. Sorry, found it. Uh, I'm not given to long statements. And I agree with you that more of the same is all we've heard so far this afternoon. Every option we've heard mentioned has been discussed, tried, and it's failed. And so quite why we put faith in uh, going back over them and hoping that one will work is something that uh, eludes me. We're simply putting the problem in the too difficult to solve box. Secondly, containment is not enough. Cont we need isolation, which is more than containment, which means much stricter sanctions still. Uh, I, have, I have to say reservations about the wisdom of President Xi seeing the North Korean delegates. I think at the very least... Uh, I hope, at the very least, he sent them away with a monstrous flea in the ear. If he didn't, he should have relegated them to a much lower level of the Chinese administration because the public appearance is that China has resumed contact with North Korea at a serious level and yet has nothing to show with it, nothing to show for it. Uh, third point, no, I've never quite understood why collapse is seen as the only alternative um, to... Uh, to, to present policies. I don't think collapse is the only alternative in North Korea. Uh, there must surely be uh, outcomes short of collapse. Even President, um, the present president of uh, North Korea cannot terrorize all the people eternally. There must be interests building up in North Korea who don't want to lose everything they have. And lastly, I mean, this talk of the military option, uh, I have to say I prefer Ash Carter Mark I to uh, Ash Carter Mark II. Of course, there is a military option. It can only be a preemptive one. It must exist. I mean, it would be criminally irresponsible of the United States not to have an option drawn up uh, for use if, in the case of absolute necessity. But... I have to say that in the Iran case, I think the notion that a military option existed was a powerful feature in persuading Iran to change its mind. I believe the same is true of North Korea. Thank you. Oh, I knew you were a soldier at heart. Um, right. Um, Shall we start with you, sir, and we'll work down there. Keep it nice and short, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, Thank you very much for the three uh, presenters uh, for a very informative uh, pre uh, presentation. And uh, my question is uh, c coming to uh, Colonel Lu from China. Uh, in my opinion, the North Korea's uh, nuclear issues is a hot issue, which creates potential risk to the regional security and make concern to many countries in the region. And uh, being sanctioned, uh, by the United Nations, North Korea may have, I think, more negative responses. So uh, as one of the major powers and one of the China's, uh, uh, you know, uh, neighbors, as uh, you, you are the neighbor of North Korea, uh, what suggestions and concrete solutions uh, to change the solutions uh, may, uh, does, uh, or will China make or suggest? To, to solve the issues in the North Korea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General. Um, Mr. Ren, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, for many years, China tried very hard to uh, induce and encourage North Korea to change uh, by taking a new path and open up their society. 
Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, China was completely unsuccessful, but uh, we've been unsuccessful uh, in terms of uh, 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 having them reverse the, the nuclear development. So I think, in my view, uh, at, for, the, for the time being, uh, we should uh, continue uh, to uh, fully in implement the uh, Security Council uh, resolutions, uh, including uh, the most recent one. And after some time, for example, six months, uh, 12 months, uh, we make assessments uh, to see whether that kind of uh, these uh, measures uh, have had some, some impact and so on. So then then we, we decide uh, what, what to do uh, next. Thank you. All the same. Okay. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, as uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Sugiyama knows, I am uh, one of the five Japanese parliamentarians who invented the current uh, uh, Japanese legislation regarding its sanctions against uh, North Korea. And uh, I was a minister in charge of science and technology in the second Abe cabinet, and uh, I used to be also in charge of territorial issue. Uh, I was a little bit shocked uh, to hear from Colonel Liu that, uh, hear from you that Chinese uh, policy options vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea are limited uh, because everybody knows uh, if uh, any type of uh, sanction against North Korea uh, you know, works or not uh, uh, very much depends on the Chinese uh, determination and uh, uh, everybody knows that uh, North Korean economy is totally dependent upon that of China. But uh, I want to believe you that China uh, is trying its best uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, influence uh, North Korea. And I think your government, uh, I understand that your government proposed uh, to resume uh, six-party you know, talk type of you know, dialogue. But, uh, but six-party talk didn't work anyway. So do you think that this kind of mechanism, like a six-party talk, can, uh, you know, uh, make uh, Kim Jong-un give up his uh, nuclear development program? And also, another question is that, no, okay. Because we really, uh, sure. uh, very good. China could do more, that is the key, sure. key, key question. Uh, and perhaps General Yao, but I don't want you to answer, she's got to answer, but what's your question? You don't want me to answer, I just want to you answer can. that everyone in China knows that the leverage on North Korea is limited. And my question, is, is, is DPRK regime still, to, to my uh, Korean and uh, Japanese colleagues here, is DPRK regime still someone to work with, to negotiate with, or is the regime, it, the only thing for us is to wait for the regime to collapse? And is it better to start talks on denuclearization and try to slow down to reduce and uh, by the end to eliminate North Korea nuclear capability, or is it better to wait idly for the North Korea to increase nuclear and missile capabilities like it has been doing for the last seven years? What is a better choice? And so that maybe at the end of the day, we have only two choices, whether to accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state or try to kill it. You have to use military means. And my one specific question to my Korean colleague is peace treaty talks a favor to the North Koreans or is it something that everyone, every party in the area, related party in the area wants? Very um, pertinent as usual, General. Um, and you've helped 
John Liu. Um, Mr. Maida, please. Yes, uh, I have very simple two questions. Uh, what is the lesson from the failure of the process of two decades, including a grand, grand bargaining approach of the uh, agri framework? Because I was involved in the uh, agri framework through the Kido process. The lesson from the, the agri framework is a, a very conventional way of the carrots and sticks. The tactics uh, did not work uh, for North Korea. And secondly, it's also that the six parties talk. The uh, pattern of the Kim Jong-un is, uh, uh, to me, is uh, quite a bit uh, similar with his father's, which is a brink point shift. Uh, by the brink point shift, they, uh, North Korea tried to be directly negotiated with, with only with the United States. So that they are manipulating, they are cheating, uh, and the, a lesson is that throughout these two decades of uh, unsuccessful uh, process, the result is that we gave the North Korea a chance to have more time to develop nuclear capability and missile capability. Now they own some of the, uh, 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 the uh, real status of the nuclear power. I don't know I, if uh, we all do not recognize it. This is a de facto basis. They have some capability. Therefore, the, uh, I think that the, uh, if we rule out the uh, military option, only option is to strengthening sanction. Because I'm an expert on sanction, the economic sanctions is really powerful. Uh, what's happened in, in, in case of Iran, Libya, and law in, in Russia, for example, cut back of the SWIFT and uh, uh, Fed wire, the financial uh, side, that's a very powerful. Because they, uh, uh, North Korea can survive if the uh, sanction itself is being implemented fully without any loophole. That's a very powerful. Uh, so the question is that how we can uh, cement that real powerful sanction regime against North Korea. I think we've got a little bit more of the same there. Um, I've got, I'd like to have two more. I'm going to open it back up. If we have any more time, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you all. Um, I know you were very quickly, and then I'll have um, one of the ones on the right. Please, I can't, my yeah. eyesight's not up to it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, speakers, uh, for the insightful speeches. Uh, as we all agree, uh, there are not so many doors open to North Korea. I think Mongolia is uh, one of the doors which are frequently open. And uh, the name tag on this door is, uh, we call it the uh, Ulaanbaatar Dialogue on Northeast Asia Security. Over the past uh, few years, we held uh, some dozen of uh, events. and. One of major events uh, coming later this month. And the uh, importance of these events in Mongolia is because North Korea usually always participate with a high level delegation. They're therefore, the discussions there, they quite uh, give some insightful uh, information on, on the uh, possible outcome. And my question would be yeah, we're all talking about the nuclear issue, the nuclear threat. But uh, we, we all know that in such a system, uh, it's not enough to talk just about the leader. It is a system. What would be, how would you rate the, the danger of uh, collapsing of such a system, which would cause a huge humanitarian and economic impact on the whole region, uh, compared to the nuclear threat? You know? Is it a real, a real time threat today, or you, you still? think there is, a, there is a opportunity, there is a room to pursue the, pol the policy we uh, hold today uh, for quite some time in the near future. Thank you. I think that's a theme that's come out. Collapse would be better than possession of a weapon, um, which is, hadn't occurred to me. But uh, I have one more, please. Uh, gentlemen, of, yeah, please. So <clears throat> I would very much like to comment on other options besides the direct use of military force or economic sanctions, but my official duty positions won't permit me to do that part of it. So three very quick or provocative things to, to think about. One, there are circumstances under which the use of military force is not optional. If the North Koreans were to attack by design or miscalculation, that is uh, something to be thought through. I wonder if they do give up the nuclear weapons, do things necessarily get immediately better? for the reasons Aiden alluded to, the domestic factors that may present a problem 
that may have uh, additional military manifestations. And the third point is, with the current balance of military power, as it were, without nuclear weapons on the peninsula, the consequences of a military conflict would still be absolutely horrific without a single nuclear weapon at play. Okay, well, thank you for that. Very important um, practical points. Um, I'm going to go, I'm afraid, because right, I am under very strict orders, I'm going to disobey them, I suspect, to finish at half past. Um, so I'm going to go back to the panel. I suspect, sadly, and I've tried my best, uh, we are not going to get to any more questions. Um, Mr. Sugiyama, please. Uh, thank you, David. Um, uh, I said um, no use of force. No recognition, uh, even de facto basis, a new status for DPRK. Um, uh, and uh, uh, as uh, Minister Yamamoto rightly pointed out, uh, how do we do? Um, uh, somebody said that uh, can only uh, we uh, be waiting uh, for them to collapse. Uh, that's not the way, because uh, we have uh, at least um, um, some sizable certain persons uh, who are still uh, waiting for the abductees to come back, and they are aging. We have no time. So all these said, combined together, what's the solution? The, uh, I, I, I don't think I can give you any panacea solution, except to say that we continue persistent uh, pressure by increasing sanctions. I do hope that that would do something good. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, like uh, Iranian cases, like other cases. And plus, persistent efforts to be open for the dialogue, to try to let us try to let them understand. Of course, um, these are not easy. These don't give us any, what, practically good solutions to be done tomorrow. But what else can we do? That's our dilemma. And that's something that we need the support of the whole international community like you. Thank you. Well, a, a carrot and stick is what you're talking about. But I would offer that a stick has to be credible. And by saying, as Charles Powell rightly reminded us, uh, that uh, military intervention is not an option, which everyone would give or take has said, you've taken away any sense in a carrot and stick. So you're already down a carrot. But anyway, carrot and stick, I think, is really what we're talking about. Okay, okay let me be brief. Um, when ideas uh, came upon... Uh, from the floor. Containment is not enough. Uh, we need uh, further isolations. If North Korea fails to comply with its obligation under the UN Security Council resolutions, they will face uh, further isolations. Um, Chinese colleague indicated that uh, South Korean government, uh, you know, waiting for a regime collapse. Well, uh, we do not pursue regime collapse of North Korea. So we realize that the Unexpected uh, collapse of North Korea regime will bring a catastrophic uh, a consequences to Korea. So um, I don't think that uh, is uh, Korean government policies. Well, we are, when we are talking about the peace treaties, of course uh, we will be uh, ready to be uh, occupied with the peace treaty with North Korea, but this is the right time because they, uh, they failed to demonstrate their sincere wills to denuclearize uh, uh, North Korea. So this is not the right time to think about peace treaties. Um, um, well, um, again, you know, uh, transforming, up, uh, transforming those uh, real nature of those regimes regime should be made orderly. So we do not uh, pursue, once again, uh, regime collapse or absorption, uh, you know, with uh, North Korea. Um, well. Let me take these opportunities, uh, you know, the, on the roles, uh, on the roles of uh, China's uh, in dealing with North Korea's nuclear issues. Well, of course, you know, China uh, shares some uh, some uh, responsibilities. Firstly, China is a member of UN Security Council and also uh, is, uh, you know, nuclear power under the NPT treaties. And uh, China wants to be a responsible regional power, but they provide. A uh, huge amount of uh, oil and food to to uh, to North Korea, uh, which means that um, serving as uh, you know lifeline to North Korea's uh, regime survival. Anyhow, 
But uh, many people, many experts uh, so far used to, uh, you know, point out that China still is uh, preoccupied uh, with the, the uh, notion that Korea, North Korea should be served as a, a kind of buffer. They are preoccupied with the, the thinking of balance of powers, uh, you know, the way of thinking. So, um, well, of course, you know, we uh, have a, a strategic dialogue with uh, China, and uh, we know that China uh, has played uh, quite uh, constructive roles uh, in dealing with North Korea in their own way. But, uh, well, you know, the, there's uh, further rooms to increase the, a, a, the positive roles uh, in dealing with uh, North Korea. That's all that I should thank add. Okay. Um, Colonel Liu. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the questions. And um, uh, you are surprised or shocked about the limitation of the Chinese government. Uh, I think uh, for, first, uh, when we are talking about DPRK, maybe uh, less of the countries can realize DPRK is an uh, equal a sovereign, sovereign state uh, as other countries in your and uh, even, even with the treaty allies like U.S., Japan, um, the United States cannot push Japan to do everything it wants. I think it's a perspective you can further understand why China's limited, uh, policy choices uh, are very limited. And secondly, thank you for mentioning the uh, six-party talks. Um, before, I think before any talks or negotiations get a positive result, it is generally believed that they are a failure. Taking the uh, uh, 1994 framework between the United States and the DPRK as an example, when Clinton administration gave up the possible surgical strike option to DPRK, it turned to a uh, negotiation with DPRK and also made great progress in easing bilateral relationship between these two countries and also step-by-step uh, -step denuclearization of DPRK. With a very complicated background, this framework failed. And then it turns to the six-party talks. And the six-party talks also got the phased uh, uh, progress and achievements. Uh, on the one hand, it uh, uh, defunctioned the uh, Ningbin uh, plutonium reactors, and uh, uh, secondly, it realized some kind of frequent talks between North and South and all parties concerned. Uh, thirdly, it gives the encouragement to DPRK to give up its nuclear program step by step, but also for the very complicated political reasons, these six-party talks cannot resolve all the problems uh, at one time. And uh, all parties concerned, especially the United States, I have to say that, including also DPRK, for the deep contradiction between these two countries, they, both of them, gave up this platform. It's not the force of China. It's not the force of other countries concerned. It, it comes from the legacy of the Cold War. It comes from the deep mm, mutual suspicion between the United States and the DPRK. But China has kept its effort on resume this party because we cannot find an alternative to resume as any other kind of multilateral platform. Even for the UN Resolution 2270 on the item 50 of 51, they claimed that we have to resume the six-party talks to resolve the nuclear problem. That approved that why we believe sanction only the ways to resolve the problem, but not the purpose of our uh, multilateral platform. And uh, for the question on the comprehensive resolution, I think uh, it's from the Vietnam friend. Um, first, I think you are right. We need a comprehensive resolution. For Chinese perspective, First, I think to denuclearize, that's very, very important in the Korean Peninsula in a peaceful way. 
and uh, at the same time, we need some commitment of DPRK on not to developing and uh, proliferating nuclear weapons, and also the commitment from the United States and its allies in the region on not pursuing the North into the corner and creating an external environment in favor of the negotiations. Second, DPRK should stop its nuclear and missile program, rejoin NPT as a nuclear free, nuclear weapon free country or nu nuclear have not country, possibly through a joint uh, security guarantee by a certain number of relevant, relevant countries, we can encourage DPRK to do it. Yes, it's a very far away or quite a far away target for all the parties concerned. I can see the disappointment of the faces here to support such kind of resolution, but I really cannot find any possible way to resume or to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. And if we just squeeze this country into the corner, I don't believe it's a very wise way to resolve the problem, and it's not benefit to all the countries concerned and not conducive to the peaceful development of the uh, region. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Colonel Liu. Um, do you need to go, or you've got a little bit longer? Um, Aidan, um, the last... Uh, do I get yours. the last word? Gosh, this is a, a weighty responsibility. Um, I just want to say a couple of things really inspired by what, what Charles Powell said. Um, I very much agree that collapse is not the only alternative. Uh, and again, I don't know if this is now history and the road not taken. Um, you said something about interests building up within the society. Well, yes, absolutely, there are. There is a sort of, there is a new capitalism. Might, uh, in a small degree, delight the heart of Lady Thatcher if she were here to, to see it. Um, there are people who have an interest in the status quo. There are probably rather a lot who don't. And that's why I, if I mourn the sunshine policy, which has been and gone, and it had many faults, um, it's because I, I'm not sentimental, but if I, I've already quoted one early British 20th century humorist, Hilaire Belloc, if I may quote Saki, of all the ways of killing a cat, choking it on cream should not be overlooked. Um, I saw sunshine as a long-term process, as erst politik was, that might have had the same ultimate result, though you might say it would be a sort of a collapse, but a, a peaceful one, creating structures of common interest. But it's, it, it, I guess it has gone now. And if I can just say one other thing, do you, do you talk to your brother at all, Charles? Because people may not know this. I mean, Charles was a senior advisor to Lady Thatcher, and his brother Jonathan was the same to Tony Blair, and helped in peace to Northern Ireland. And Jonathan Powell's consultancy has been going to North Korea. I'm not blabbing any secrets here, because every time he goes, the North Koreans publish it. His interlocutor was the late Kang Sok Ju, so the fact that your interlocutor is dead doesn't actually help, but one rather hopes there are things going on behind the scenes, because um, that's the only hope I can see, and I will conclude. I'm going to invent a brand new Korean proverb. Once more we have ridden the North Korean horse around the field, and we still can't find the gate. Thank you. Well, um, on your behalf, uh, may I thank the panel. I would just say as a minor strategist that any coherent strategy is one in which ends, ways, and means are properly synthesized. This is clearly an example of an unsound strategy, uh, but let's hope that from these discussions something better uh, pragmatically comes out of it. But on your behalf, uh, may, we, may I thank the four panelists. Fantastic performance. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.